Okay, well, thank you all for braving the weather. It looks pretty ugly out there, but I think it's going to turn around. Uh, we're doing the Dining with a Doctor today, and I am here, Dr. Chris Stanley. I'm the medical director of the minimally invasive GYN division here at Waterman Hospital. I'm also the director of the Center for Gynecology and Pelvic Surgery here at Waterman Hospital. I'm new to the area, but I'm not new to gynecology. I uh, trained at uh, University of South Florida for med school, uh, then Vanderbilt in Nashville for my OBGYN. And for the last 10 years, I was over at Halifax Medical Center, where we ran the robotics program and the uh, GYN surgery program there. So I've been here since July. Like we said, uh, we're going to talk about pelvic surgery. <clears throat> and really, we want to understand about pelvic floor anatomy, and we want to understand uh, the, the issues with when the pelvis, or the organs in the pelvis get out of place. And our objectives today are to define what pelvic organ prolapse is, to uh, recognize how common the problem is, show you the pelvic anatomy so everyone understands what we're talking about when we're talking about the organs in the pelvis, uh, the predisposing factors that can cause problems with prolapse, and then talk about treatment options. The most uh, basic definition of pelvic prolapse is just the organs in the pelvis fall out of place. And they fall out of place because we lose the muscle support the ligaments and the fascia that support the pelvis. There's three basic areas of support, this large muscle uh, group called the levator ani muscle. Then we have ligaments, and ligaments are real thick pieces of connective tissue. Um, and if the ligaments are in the shape of ropes and cords, we call them ligaments. If they're in f sheets, we call it fascia. So ligaments in, that are rope-like hold things up, Fascia tends to cover things. And one of the easiest ways to think of pelvic organ support is to think of a hammock. Uh, you have your trees as your support. You have the ropes that come down to the actual canvas of the hammock. If you're laying on the hammock and you all of a sudden find yourself on the ground, one of three things or all of those three things could have happened. You know, the tree could have fallen over, the rope could have broke, or the canvas could have split. So our job as pelvic re, uh, reconstructive surgeons is to figure out what actually went wrong. And it may be one or all of those areas here that need repair. The major structure of the pelvis is this levator ani muscle. And it's really made of three or four big muscle groups and bands of muscle. And they go in an anterior posterior uh, orientation. And they really sit at the bottom of your pelvis. So when you're standing up upright, Everything that keeps your organs from falling on the floor is this uh, levator ani muscle. And the only problem with this design, you know, Mother Nature doesn't mess up much, but this time we have a little problem with the design of the pelvic floor because in the pelvis, which is a very busy little area, we have three separate organ systems. We have the urinary tract, we have the reproductive tract, and we have the digestive tract. All those areas, all those uh, organ systems need a way to get things out. So we have to basically design three separate defects in our support system. And this kind of gives you an idea, it's a little schematic here, of the support that we see here with the muscles of the pelvis attached with ligaments to the bony part of the pelvis. But we have three areas where we can have potential problems, where the urethra, where the urine leaves, the vagina, where the baby leaves, and then we have the anus and the rectum, where the digestive matter is uh, released. This is a problem because it adds three areas of weakness. This is why men don't have nearly the problems as women do in terms of pelvic prolapse because men don't have an area with the, that's uh, analogous to the vagina. The urethra is very small, the anus is typically small, but the vagina has to be big enough, a potential space large enough to allow a baby to pass through. That leads to a lot of potential weakness. So that's why women have pelvic floor issues with bladders out of place and uteruses, where men typically don't have those problems. Men's weak spot is up in the groin where they have inguinal hernias. It's another angle. This is that lithotomy position. And we can see here the muscle bands come all the way across. There's separate groups of muscle. But again, we have our areas of weakness with the urethra, the vagina, and the anus there. So this is a problem. This is a problem by design. So this is why we are always struggling with pelvic prolapse. The fascia is, again, this connective tissue that's very strong. When it's in long strips and rope-like and little cords, we call it ligaments. And we name the ligaments from where they go to uh, what they attach to. 
So the principal ligaments in the pelvis are the uterosacral ligaments and the cardinal ligaments. The uterosacral ligaments keep the uterus up in place. It attaches the uterus to the sacrum. The sacrum is that back part of the spine. And the pubo-cervical fascia wraps itself around the bladder in a sheet-like form. And the rectovaginal fascia uh, is between the vagina and the rectum. And this is a picture. <clears throat> stole this from Dr. John Miklos. He's a really, really great surgeon up in Atlanta. It's too far for you guys to go to, so I don't mind telling you how good he is, but he does a lot of this pelvic floor surgery, and he's excellent. Um, what we see here is what a pelvis looks like before childbirth, before any trauma to the pelvis. And you see here the uterus and the vagina. And look at that orientation. This looks like a hockey stick or a number seven, okay? The uterus is not in a straight up and down line with the vagina in the normal, fa in the normal pelvis. So we have the uterus in close approximation to the bladder. We have the rectum back here with the vagina. We have these uterosacral ligaments that keep the uterus in place. We have the fascia here of the uh, pubocervical fascia or the vesovaginal fascia, which keeps the bladder and the vagina in a nice position. And then back here, there's a big band of tissue. It's called the rectovaginal septum or the rectovaginal fascia. So all these areas are really important to keep the organs in place. So what can, what can damage our organs? What, what can make those ligaments um, not work? Or what can break those ligaments? What can stretch that fascia? Well, number one thing is pelvic trauma, direct trauma to the pelvic tissues. And the number one trauma to the pelvic tissues is childbirth. Now, now I don't deliver babies anymore, but I've delivered over 2,000 babies. And I can tell you, the pelvis is never again the same after a vaginal delivery. It's just, it's just physics. You've got a four centimeter vagina and a 10 centimeter head, something's gonna give, and it's, it's not the head. So this is a problem. The tissues never are the same. But there's other issues that can attack or can damage the pelvis, and one of them is nerve injury. We have a large, big muscle in the pelvis. It needs a nerve supply to know how to contract. Well, everyone around here has had you know, their foot fall asleep or their arm fall asleep. You get that pins and needles feeling, uh, what do you do? You move your arm, you reposition your foot, you get your nerves back, you, the nerves aren't damaged, the muscles do what they're supposed to do. But you can't do that in the latter part of pregnancy. You've got this large uterus pushing down in the pelvis. Thick bony pelvis, big heavy uterus, nerves are getting, getting compressed in there. And you can't move that, so those nerves get damaged and they may never come back. So if those nerves are damaged to the point they can't innervate the pelvis, then the muscles in the pelvis sag down and the organs fall out of place. Sometimes the tissues are just lousy tissue. Sometimes tissues are real stretchy. They don't have a lot of tensile strength. Number one cause of that is smoking. Okay, you look around, you see people who smoke, you can see the wrinkles in their face, everything sags down, because smoke kills collagen. Okay? So when you smoke, all those tissues in the pelvis are weakened. Other things that weaken the connective tissues could be uh, autoimmune disorders, um, chronic steroid use, chemotherapy. Other things attack the, uh, attack the pelvic uh, structures also, but smoking by far is, is the most important thing that you can modify. Anything that increases intra-abdominal pressure, lots of lifting, increased weight, chronic cough with smoking, all puts more pressure on the pelvis. Because we're upright, you're pushing down when you stand up. Now, people, a lot of people have these risk factors, but not everyone gets pelvic prolapse, and we wonder why that is. And there's probably some other uh, predisposing factors that lead to pelvic prolapse. One is uh, genetics, you know, heredity. If your mom had pelvic prolapse, you're at more risk for having it. But it's hard to kind of tease that out. I mean, is that really a genetic issue, or is it just the fact that your mom had a baby, and that's why she has pelvic prolapse? So maybe your mom's prolapse is your, problem, your fault. Um, <laughs> I've been, <laughs> I've been doing pelvic floor surgery for 20 years, and I can probably count on my one hand uh, the number of Asian women I've had to do a surgery on. There, it's just an amazing racial um, dis or a, uh, difference between uh, white women, black women, and Asian women. And, and it's not really clear why that is, but very few Asian women have a problem with pelvic prolapse. Lots of white women do. Pregnancy and childbirth we talked about. Age, the longer you're upright, the more years you're upright, the more things push down. So you got, the older you get, the more likely you are to have pelvic prolapse. Once you get past your menopause and you lose your estrogen, 
And we can make, we could talk for days about estrogen. You know, I can make a living just doing nothing but estrogen. You know, Suzanne Summers slapping her gums about estrogen. I mean, people are always talking about estrogen. Bottom line is, it's a controversial topic, but the bottom line is, your pelvis loves it. The vagina loves estrogen. The muscles of the pelvis love estrogen. When you lose your estrogen, you lose a lot of support. Again, intra-abdominal pressure, that can be increased weight, cough, constipation. People do a lot of lifting, waitresses, nurses, child care workers. Uh, people just do a lot of heavy manual labor, have more problems. And then, you know, some of the things that we do as doctors can make prolapse more common. You know, it wasn't until the early 1990s that we realized that when we do a hysterectomy, if we're not real careful about replacing the pelvic support structures, that vagina is going to fall down over time. And I spend a lot of time right now repairing vaginal vault prolapse, where the vagina is falling down out of place. So when I do a hysterectomy now, most of my time is spent not removing the uterus, but rebuilding the pelvic support structures. So when we're talking about pelvic support, you know, what, what can fall down? Like I said earlier, three major uh, systems in there, the urinary tract, the reproductive tract, and the GI tract. So any of these organs can fall down, the urethra, bladder, uterus, rectum, even the perineum, which is that area, that part of your body that's outside between the vagina and the rectum can fall down out of place. Now, if that perineum is out of place, it's very difficult to have normal bowel function and normal sexual function. So anything in the pelvis, really anything below the waist and above the knees can fall out of place. So sometimes it's easier to think of uh, the pelvis in, in compartments, uh, anterior compartment, middle, and posterior. When I'm talking to other doctors about, you know, what kind of procedure I'm going to perform, it's easier for me sometimes to put it in this term. Um, and it sometimes just makes things a little bit easier to categorize. Again, here's our picture from Dr. Miklos. Again, normal looking pelvis, excellent pelvic support, big thick uterosacral ligaments, excellent uh, vessel vaginal tissues, rectal vaginal septum, all perfect, perfect pelvis here. And you can see how this works because when you're up and about, say that you're uplifting, say that you're coughing and you're sneezing, when all that pressure comes down on the uterus, it's coming down in a way that it pushes against the pubic bone, and it's not pushing down and out. So this is how Mother Nature here wants the uterus and the vagina to be positioned. But when we lose our uterosacral ligaments, look what happens. The uterus, which used to be in that number seven position, is now pretty much vertical. So now, now physics works against us. Now when you cough, sneeze, laugh, the vagina is getting pushed down, the uterus is getting pushed down and the bladder comes down with it, and the rectum can come down with it. So without our uterosacrals here, that's really the first step to, to really major pelvic organ prolapse. When we do the hysterectomy, like I alluded to earlier, if we remove the uterus but don't connect these uterosacrals to the top of the vagina, the vagina is going to fall down over time. Now, it might take a year, it might take 10 years, but it's going to happen. And a vagina that falls down and, and turns inside out can be pretty scary to a lot of patients. So we really have to fix that. And when we do our surgery now, we want to reconnect the uterosacrals to the top of the vagina. This restores the integrity of the pelvis. If we have the vagina fall down here, the bowel, especially the small bowel, can follow it out. And the vagina is typically about 10 centimeters long, so that means it can turn inside out about 10 centimeters. So that's about halfway down your thigh. So all those organs can fall down that far. So if your organs are getting tugged down from below there, you can imagine that hurts. Uh, it's almost like getting kicked in the stomach because all those, all those, uh, the bowel is getting tugged and all the supporting structures that they have. So pelvic prolapse, you may notice more aching and a dull ache and just general just soreness in your belly because the vagina is not well supported. Now here's an example of what can happen where you have an isolated defect somewhere else, uh, the uterus is in perfect position here because our uterosacral ligaments are in nice position. The bladder here is behaving well, but this area here, it has a defect and the rectum can bulge out into the vagina. It's called a rectocele. What you notice here though is there's no reason to assume there's any problem with the uterus. In the old days, uh, you know, when I first started this, it would be routine. If you had any vaginal surgery, they would just kind of just throw the uterus in with it. And say, well, we're going to fix the rectum. Let's just take the uterus out while we're there. That doesn't make any sense. It's like if you broke your elbow and I'm going to fix your wrist just because I'm there. We need to be site-specific about what we're trying to repair. 
you know, sure, sometimes the uterosacrals are having problems and the rectum has a problem, but you got to be really specific. So a lot of times I offer the patients to repair just what's not working. We don't have to take out a healthy uterus to fix a defect in the bladder or the, or the rectum. So what are the symptoms of problems? I can tell you, I've been doing this for a long, long time, and I've never, never had a woman come in and say, you know, Dr. Stanley, my uterus cycles just aren't what they used to be. You know, that doesn't happen. They come in with symptoms of pressure, discomfort. Uh, oftentimes, they'll be in a sh they describe they're in the shower or something, and they notice something, some bulge they never had before. And that can be very scary to them because the first thing they think of is a tumor or something bad. Um, back pain, like we were talking about, back abdominal pain, very common. And if the organs are out of place, uh, the organs aren't going to work very well. So bladder dysfunction and problems with bowel function are sometimes the earliest symptoms or what brings a patient in that she can't use her bladder well or have normal bowel movements. We can grade these on a scale, uh, different scales. You know, pelvic prolapse, it isn't like a light switch. It's not like all or nothing. It's not like you have perfect support or you have no support. The, um, so it's, a, it's like a dimmer switch instead of a light switch. There's, you know, grades. It happens gradually, typically. Uh, zero to four, there's different ways to grade it. If, I mean, it's never a life-threatening issue, but it can be a quality of life issue. Uh, if the prolapse is so severe that you have rubbing of uh, the prolapse against the clothes and things like that, you can get bleeding. You can get even ulcerations in the, in the vaginal tissues. And then once you have any breaks in the skin, then you can get infection. Uh, if the bladder is not emptying completely, you can get bladder infections. Uh, I'd say probably once or twice a year, I'll have a patient in the emergency room who can't urinate at all because the bladder is falling down so low, she can't empty the bladder. And that, in theory, could lead to renal failure, but I would tell you that's very, very rare. But uh, the symptoms here are something that, yeah, it could give you some trouble. Never going to kill you, really, but it can definitely upset you. Just to talk a little bit about incontinence, because this is a real common issue, and it's related to pelvic prolapse, because again, if the bladder is out of place, it's not going to work very well. Stress incontinence is very common. Half the women in this room over age 50 have bladder control issues, half of them. Uh, and for some reason, uh, people put up with it. And it's really a shame, because you should never let your bladder run your life. Your bladder should not leak. After you're potty trained, you're done with diapers. It should never happen again, OK? And I think that it's, if you thought about this, if half the men you knew were leaking on themselves after age 50, it would be a national tragedy, okay? There'd be like telethons and stuff about the tragedy of incontinence, okay? But we, we don't do that, you know, women don't do that. Uh, and, and they should, they should realize that incontinence is not a normal part of aging, it's uh, not inevitable, and we can fix it in the vast majority of cases. Urge incontinence especially. Urge incontinence is one of the simplest things to treat with physical therapy and medication. Urge incontinence, that, that sensation where you're walking around feeling really good and all of a sudden, uh, you know, got to find a bathroom. That, we can almost always fix that with pelvic floor therapy and medication. Almost never requires surgery. And then sometimes you have a mixed pattern where there's stress and there's urge. And just a little bit about uh, rectal incontinence and fecal incontinence. It's a very common problem. Uh, women who've had, you know, large babies, forceps deliveries, things like that. Very common, very debilitating. People never talk about it, but, and, and most doctors have like zero interest in it because it's so hard to work up and so hard to treat. But we deal with it because it's, it's a huge, huge quality of life issue for these women. And when we make these women better, they're very, very happy. So we talked a little bit about what prolapse is, what can be out of place, how it falls out of place, you know, what can we do? Once we identify the problem, the patient comes in, we work her up, and we say, okay, now what do you want to do? And we have all kinds of options, from no treatment to you know, significant major reconstructive surgery. And it really depends on what the patient's goals are and what her, what her complaints are. So observation is always appropriate. I have a lot of patients who come in, we diagnose pelvic prolapse. They didn't know what was going on. They were scared to death. They had a tumor in the vagina. They just wanted to know that there's nothing wrong. We explain what pelvic prolapse is, what the natural history is. And a lot of them would just say, OK, well, as long as I know what it is, I'm willing to watch and wait and see what happens. Because some of the things, remember, we talked about causes of pelvic prolapse. Well, some of those things you can modify. You know, if you're a smoker, you can quit smoking. If you have diabetes, you can get your blood sugar under better control. If you're overweight, you can lose some weight. So some of these things you can modify and reduce your symptoms of pelvic prolapse. <clears throat> Sometimes a woman will come in with 
complete vaginal prolapse. I mean, the vagina is, t is totally inside out, right down to the mid thigh, and she has not a zero. She has zero complaints. So that lady is in total denial about this problem. So is that appropriate to watch? It's a little dicey. And, but I'll tell you, if, if she has no ulcerations in the vagina, no bleeding, and she has normal bladder function, you can even let that go for observation. But it's, it's amazing the, the degree of prolapse some women will put up with, either because they're scared of it or they don't know there's anything that can be done with it. One thing that we always offer people, because again, remember that one of the biggest support structures of the pelvis is the muscle and in the nerves, pelvic floor rehab, pelvic floor physical therapy especially with urge incontinence, it really plays a role. And it uh, basically retrains your pelvis to just respond to the normal nerves. Remember our nerve supply may have been damaged during childbirth, so what physical therapy does, it helps you to recruit new muscle groups and new nerve uh, fibers into the mix. So we can really get some good results with pelvic floor rehab and it's not invasive. Uh, now this is not Kegel exercises, okay? And this is not, it is a totally different. Uh, Kegel exercises, it's one of the most misunderstood uh, concepts, that idea where you're supposed to try to stop your stream of urine and squeeze down for 10 seconds. And that's not what physical floor pelvic rehab is about. Uh, Kegel exercises are good for one thing, and that's sex. They're, it's good for orgasm, it's good for partner satisfaction, all worthy goals, but it's not gonna do anything for your bladder because a lot of these injuries are ligamentous, which, you know, ligaments got tore. So it's like if you tore your knee ligaments and you're working on your quads, that's great for your quads. It's not going to help your knee. And if there's no nerve supply to the nerves, I mean to the muscles, you got to recruit some new nerves. So Kegel exercises, totally misunderstood, not, not a bad thing, but it's not going to help incontinence typically. So I have patients who have significant prolapse and they don't want surgery, but they want something done. Is there a non-surgical option? There definitely is. And it's kind of an oldie but goodie, kind of back to the future sort of thing. It's pessaries. Pessaries enjoyed a, a wave of, of popularity in the 50s, you know, 40s, 50s, before we had really good surgeries. They're basically little round donuts that go into the vagina and, and give you support. Uh, there's different types. Um, there's different uh, women who should or shouldn't use them. Bottom line is, if she's gonna put a pessary in at home, she has to have a lot of muscle strength in her hand and a lot of flexibility. If she can't handle putting the pessary in at home and taking it out at home, then she comes into my office every four to, four to eight weeks and we do it for her. That's a lot of visits, but it saves her from surgery. It can give you some significant relief from your symptoms. There are many different pessaries because there's many different problems with the pelvis. Some pessaries are for incontinence. Some pessaries are because the vagina has fallen down. Some pessaries are because uh, the, the uh, bladder is out of place. Some pessaries are, f you need um, this all total support. So finding the right pessary is often a challenge. So a lot of doctors don't have a lot of experience with pessaries and they don't have a lot of interest in pessaries because it's very labor intensive and you don't get paid much for them. In fact, I pay for the pessary when a patient comes in. So, you know, it's, you don't make any money on that. So a lot of doctors don't want to do it. But if I can keep you out of the operating room and you're happy, it's worth it. Um, but it's, and, and I'll tell you what, one pessary will last a lifetime unless you flush it away, but you don't want to do that. So um, this is a little schematic of how a pessary would lift the uterus up. You, it goes inside, it's like an old diaphragm. People used to use diaphragms a lot. If, if a woman used a diaphragm for birth control when she was younger, she usually does pretty well with a pessary. So it goes in, lifts organs up, you know, very, very nice to use, but it is labor intensive. And I'll tell you honestly, most women you use it six or eight months and then they kind of use it as a bridge to get to some surgery. Because after a while they just get tired of it. So <clears throat> what if, you are just fed up with the prolapse, you're worried about it, it's, it's interfering with your life, you're not having uh, the fun that you want because you can't exercise, you can't have sex, you can't enjoy things, you can't laugh, you can't sneeze, can't jump on the trampoline. What can you do then? You, you can do some surgery. And really there's three types of surgery that we do as pelvic floor surgeons. We can restore the normal anatomy using your own tissue. So remember that fascia that's there and those ligaments that are there, a lot of times we can go do our surgery, find those, and sew them back together and repair them, just using your own natural tissues. 
Other times, uh, there's really nothing to repair. The tissues are so shredded or the damage is so severe that you have to use a mesh or a graft. Uh, it's like a little patch that you put on, a, like if you tore your quilt. If you couldn't sew the edges together, you just put a patch on it. And that's compensatory. Now, there's a lot of controversy on mesh right now, um, and I could talk for hours about that. Um, bottom line is, some people need mesh, some people don't. If your doctor's gonna put it in, make sure they know how to put it in because it's very hard to get out if you don't like it. And then there's the obliterative techniques, which I'll just talk to you at the end because I'm not a big fan of uh, obliterating the vagina. So what are our goals of surgery? We want to alleviate symptoms. We want to restore normal anatomy, normal function. We want to avoid any new problems. And we want to preserve sexual function. And we want to avoid surgical complications. Anyone who operates gets surgical complications. The only way not to have a complication is never to operate. The, the key there is to see what your doctor's rate of complications are. If he has or she has you know, a 1% complication rate, that's pretty good. If they have a 25% complication rate, you need a second opinion and probably another doctor. The bottom line is you want your doctor to do a lot of procedures, not to have been doing them for a long time. You don't want a guy who sits there and has been doing this for 50 years and does one case a year. You want a guy who does 50 cases in a month. That's who you want. That's what you need to seek out. You also don't want to cause a new problem. And so if I have a lady that comes in with leaking, with incontinence, when she laughs, sneezes, and coughs, if I do a procedure where she can't urinate at all, that's a bad thing. You know? If she goes into total urinary retention because I you know, snugged the bladder up too much, I didn't do her any favors. So you have to be very, very careful that you don't lose sight that we want to restore normal function. Now usually, if you restore normal anatomy, you're gonna, everything else is gonna fall into place. But this is an example of one of the classic uh, vaginal support procedures that we've been taught for years and years and years. It's called the sacrospinous ligament suspension. It is designed to alleviate the symptoms of pelvic prolapse. The vagina falls down, she stands up, the vagina's halfway down her legs, we put it back up, it's all cinched up, we're done, right? No, look at this. Have you, I mean, I've been doing this for 20 years, I've examined thousands of women, I've never seen one woman's vagina skew off to the right like that. That's not normal. I mean, that didn't follow the criteria, okay? We alleviated her symptoms, but we didn't restore normal anatomy. I can guarantee you, you know, unless she's got a partner who skews over that way, this is gonna be a problem. Okay? That doesn't work. We want normal anatomy. We go back to that midline. So vaginal surgery is very nice because it's quick, it's safe, less pain, but sometimes it doesn't give us the anatomic correction that we want. So we have abdominal surgery where we make a big incision across the belly. We take the vagina and attach it to the, the sacrum or the back of the spine using a mesh or a graft. Well, that's nice because you get normal anatomy, but what about all the rigmarole of going through the abdominal wall, all the complications of the wound incision, all that sort of stuff? So it's kind of a trade-off. You know, we got vaginal surgery that does good things. We got abdominal surgery that does good things. We got, we got some bad sides to both of those. So what we can do is, is there a way to get the benefits of the vaginal surgery with... Uh, with the, also the benefits of the abdominal approach, but, but without the side effects. Well, what can we do to do that? Well, it's laparoscopy. And laparoscopy is really getting all the benefits of abdominal surgery, but using tiny, small incisions. So instead of one 12 inch incision, we're using three, four dime size, you know, five millimeter incisions. So the benefit here is that the incisions are smaller. Uh, the pain or discomfort is much reduced. Your hospital stay, instead of three or five days, you're out of the hospital with an abdominal, with a laparoscopic procedure in about in the same day, if not in that afternoon, the next morning. Recovery is very quick. Most people are back to work in a week and return to normal activities like, you know, driving, walking, exercise, really within a couple of days, if not the next day. So minimally invasive surgery adds all these benefits. So minimally invasive surgery is kind of a catchphrase for laparoscopy and robotics. We have reduced blood loss. We have fewer complications because the incisions are smaller. Shorter hospital stay, faster recovery, less scarring. Now remember, vaginal surgery 
is kind of the originally minimally invasive surgery, and there's a lot of good things about vaginal surgery. I don't want to talk down vaginal surgery. It is minimally invasive. You're using uh, a natural entry point into the body, so you're not making really any new holes in the body. You're using, you know, what nature gave you. The minimal scarring, because you don't see the top scar at the very top of the vagina. Again, we can do it with a very short hospital stay, especially compared to an abdominal hysterectomy. The problem with vaginal surgery is that it's very hard to perform because it's very hard to learn because it's very hard to teach. It's very, very difficult to teach a young doctor how to do vaginal surgery because there's just no way to look while you're doing it. Um, some people feel it's not indicated for many patients. You know, if you haven't had children, it's hard to do. Large fibroids, things like that. Most cancer cases you can't use vaginal surgery for, but it's very hard to teach, that's the bottom line. Now at Vanderbilt, we had a huge emphasis on vaginal surgery, so we, everything was vaginal, and we, we learned to do vaginal surgery. It's unfortunately becoming kind of a lost art, which is a shame because it, it is really the initial minimally invasive procedure. Now when we're talking about, again, the benefits of laparoscopic surgery, the one that really is obvious is instead of a large incision from above the belly button down to the pubic bone, we're using small little dime-sized incisions and we can hide most of those pretty well. You don't have the big, even this bikini cut incision is a big incision and it takes a long time to heal from. So we want to do these uh, small little incisions so you're out the door pretty quick. Well, if, if laparoscopy is so good, you know, why don't we all do it? Well, because it's hard. Um, you're, you're, you got some limitations. One is that you're working from a two-dimensional image. You're working on a TV screen. You might, it might be high definition, but it's not 3D, so you have no depth perception. The instruments are stiff and they're long, and everything you do is counterintuitive. So if you want to go up, you got to move down. If you're going to go left, you want to go right. It's like working in a mirror. Um, you have reduced dexterity because your instruments only move up and down, left and right. And it's, it's harder on the surgeon. It's better for the patient, it's harder on the surgeon and you really can't get much assistance. So you're really kind of flying solo there with these big procedures. Now, just to give you an idea how this really works, and this is how I practice this, because you know, I think it's really important to practice every day. It's like if you're playing a musical instrument, you gotta practice every day. Well, I can't operate every day, so what do I do to practice? And this is true, you can, you can go do this at home. If you get a mirror, put a mirror in front of you, and get some shoes, and then you try to tie your shoes with chopsticks while looking in the mirror. That is what, that, that's true, and that's how I keep my dexterity up because that is what, that's the experience of laparoscopic surgery. And, you know, it, my wife thinks I'm nuts when I do that, but it works very well, it's very cheap. But it keeps me, you know, kind of limber and ready to go. But, uh, but that's why most people don't do really complex surgery with a laparoscope. So we're kind of stuck, so we're, you know, how do we get the, the benefits of the vaginal surgery without the big incisions if you can't do laparoscopy? Well. That's where the robot comes in, okay? You may have heard of robotic surgery, and a lot of misconceptions about robotic surgery. It, you know, I ran the robot program over at Halifax. Uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful piece of technology for the right patient, for the right surgeon, and it does overcome a lot of the drawbacks of straight stick laparoscopy. It is, right now, there's only one company that makes it, uh, Da Vinci Surgical. And full disclosure, I do teach for Da Vinci, but I'm not, you know, that's not why I'm doing the talk today. Um, they lose their patent protection in two years, and then I can guarantee the market will be flooded with new robots, and that'll be good for everybody. The surgeon's in control of the robot at all times, okay? The robot cannot go crazy and start doing things you don't want it to do. People just have this idea that the robot can take over. It can't. Whatever you tell it to do, it'll do. If you don't tell it to do anything, it just stops. And you have direct access to three robotic arms and one camera arm. And you've got great vision. It's got two cameras, so you have 3D vision. So now you have depth perception. And depth perception is very important when you're doing complex cases. You have a lot of dexterity. You put your fingers in these little actuators, these little control handles, and whatever your hands do, whatever your fingers do, any motion that they do, the little robotic arms do it. And these little robotic uh, instruments perform your surgery for you. The Nice thing is that these instruments are incredibly small. They're very tiny. And they're less than a dime size. I mean, they're very, very small. And the other thing about robotic surgery is you can do it from a distance. Um, I don't know if I have a picture here, but the, the console is separate from the patient. 
Now, typically when we operate, we're in the same room, but you don't have to be. The way this robotic thing all came up is that NASA realized that they're going to send people to Mars and stuff like that. We might have to operate on someone up there, and we better figure out a way to have the doctor here while the patient is you know, halfway across the galaxy up there. So they came up with this idea of, of telesurgery. So we can actually, if you have enough broadband cable width, you can operate in Tampa and have your patient in Paris. And they've, they've done it you know, to show it can be done, but the idea is to take the surgery um, to where the patient is. The surgeon can be anywhere, but take the machine to where the patient is. So that's going to be the real interesting uh, application of this, this uh, whole idea, the whole platform. So just kind of again go over pelvic prolapse surgery because it's really important to understand. I'm a big fan of vaginal surgery. If you can do it and do it well and get the same repair. If you can't get everything done that you want vaginally, Let's forget abdominal cases and go to the laparoscopic cases. This way we get the best of both worlds. We get the minimally invasive procedure, you're home the same day, little pain, no blood transfusions, you're doing great, but we don't have to suffer that big, big incision in the belly. So vaginal surgery, laparoscopic surgery, abdominal surgery should be a last resort. And ideally the only surgery we'll ever be doing abdominally in OBGYN will be C-section. I mean, I agree, there'll be no way to get baby out with a laparoscope. I agree with that. <laughs> so now cobalclesis, this is another, this is one, uh, one form of treatment for vaginal prolapse or, or pelvic prolapse. And in the te this is an actual quote from the textbook. And it says, in a frail elderly woman who does not wish to be sexually active in the future, uh, cobalclesis is a simple, safe, effective surgical procedure that relieves the symptoms. Well, it also relieves them of their vagina. And I think that is bizarre. I think that's, that's dehumanizing, it's defeminizing. To remove the vagina, basically sew it shut, just because you have pelvic prolapse, is not the answer, okay? That is not a good thing. I, I know people still do it, but I do not think you should remove a woman's vagina just because she has pelvic prolapse. If your doctor recommends this, I really do think you need a second opinion, because I do not think that's an appropriate, because you never know what's gonna happen. You might be 75 now, you might meet someone when you're 80, I don't know. But you know, you don't just cut off all the, you don't burn the bridges, you just don't do that. So I think you should keep the vagina for as long as you are around. So summary, number one, I want you to understand pelvic prolapse is common. It is typically a result of, of childbirth. Uh, it's a complex problem. And up until about 1990, when you had pelvic floor surgery, pelvic repair surgery, you typically had three doctors working with you. You had a gynecologist do your hysterectomy. While you were asleep, a urologist probably came in who you never saw and did your bladder repair. And then if there was a rectal seal, you had a colorectal guy who you never saw do your rectal repair all while you were asleep. The only person you ever saw was your gynecologist. You didn't see anyone else. This is a very inefficient way to provide care. Um, what urogynecology is, is it's one surgeon who has a pretty clear understanding of how all those organ systems are intimately related. You cannot work on one and neglect what happens to the other. I mean, I can't repair the vagina and not be aware that the bladder might be affected by this. Uh, I can't remove the uterus without worrying about how the vagina is going to behave and the bladder is going to behave. So urogynecology is very important. It's a relatively new specialty. Uh, it's probably in the last 20 years it's really you know, starting to take off. But it's really important because the engineering and the physics of the pelvic floor are so complex. There are treatments that don't require surgery that are very effective, especially for urge incontinence. And I can tell you, in 20 years of doing this, I, I don't think I've ever seen a woman who we couldn't make better. Now, we might not cure every woman with stress incontinence, prolapse, pain, pressure, all those things, but it's very, very, very rare that we can't find a way to make you better, improve your quality of life. Might not be perfect. But I, I can't believe we couldn't make it better for you. So that is the talk about pelvic prolapse. And if you have any questions, I'll be glad to go over them with you. Okay. Robotic surgery. <clears throat> I was a director of the robotics program at Halifax. We brought it out in 2007. Um, I'm a big believer in it. Uh, Florida Hospital in Orlando has, uh, I think, three robots at Florida South and five robots at Celebration. The entire country of Canada has four robots. Uh, we don't need that many robots, okay? If you can operate with straight sticks, you can do 95% of, of what you need to do with, that, with a robot. 
So one of the things that our goal is here is to teach people how to do these really complex procedures. It's hard to teach them, but I think that's a much better way to spend our healthcare dollars. Each robot's $2 million. Each robot needs a, a six-figure maintenance policy. Uh, each robot costs, it adds about $6,000 per case. So if you're getting a benefit for that, I think it's worth it. And where's the benefit? The benefit is in cancer surgery. Um, five years ago, almost every woman with endometrial or uterine cancer had a big incision in the hospital for four days, was six or eight weeks out of, out of commission before she could get her chemo or whatever. When I left Halifax, our patients were going home with cancer surgery the next morning. That is a huge benefit. That is worth $6,000. That is worth every penny of it because it gets her out of the office, I mean, gets her out of the uh, hospital, gets her away from the germs, gets her back to chemo quick if she needs it. So in the right case, I mean, I think robotics is great. Um, if I have a patient who I really think needs robotics, I can refer her down to uh, Celebration or uh, Florida South. And those are typically really only for the cancer cases where we think we're gonna be needing to take lymph nodes out around the aorta because you go back to the depth perception. Um, if I'm gonna be taking big lymph nodes out of the aorta, it's nice to be having some depth perception. I don't wanna poke something. Um, and the robot really gets you around that. So my little soapbox on robots, I think uh, for the right patient it's good. I don't need it typically. Bulking, okay, uh, question is what about bulking? And that's a good point, I didn't bring that up. Uh, bulking, bulking is a procedure uh, or a treatment in a patient with stress urinary incontinence. Now, when someone comes into my office and they tell me that they're having leaking, that doesn't tell me a whole heck of a lot. It would be like if someone came in and told me they had a fever. Well, I mean, I don't know why you have a fever. Let's, let's investigate why. If I just gave you Tylenol and said, here, you know, see what happens. I got rid of your fever, but I didn't get rid of the cause of the fever. So you come in with stress incontinence, we have to do an exam, and we have to do what's called a systemetrogram. The systemetrogram allows us to see how the bladder functions. The nerve supply to the bladder, the emptying capacity of the bladder, the strength of the little muscle in the urethra, how much mobility the urethra has, all these things come together. Bulking is just what it sounds like. You have, if you can imagine the urethra is a little tube, if you inject protein and collagen into the tube and close down the diameter, you increase resistance to flow. So she may, be able not to leak if you close that down. If you inject that urethra with enough protein, it gets skinny on the inside and she doesn't leak. It can work very well. The, the major downside of it is that it's temporary. Usually you have to do it every six to nine months. Um, some people are allergic to it, uh, to the collagen. But I think for some people it works very well. Um, I don't do a lot of it anymore. I used to do a fair amount of it. But now with the, the mini slings and the outpatient slings that we can use, I uh, get much better results that are permanent with, with the, uh, the sling rather than the bulking. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you gotta cut, I think after a while the tissues get kind of scarred and the, and the urethra just won't bulk up anymore. So uh, for some people it works well. Uh, other people, you'll notice that its efficacy or its efficiency uh, wanes over time. But uh, it, it, is a, it is a viable option that uh, I just don't do it, so I, I forgot to mention that. Sorry about that. So that's a good surgeon. So the question is, the statement was that she had a total abdominal hysterectomy with her ovaries removed all vaginally. And that's great. That person knows what they're doing. It's probably an older doc who's been around the block and knows, knows his way around the vagina. I mean, it works great. Um, it's, t <laughs> well. <laughs> but it, it's hard to do. You know, it's like the old, you know, changing spark plugs with the tailpipe story. I mean, it's hard to do. Um, but you can do it if you're well-trained. So, and if, but you can get the ovaries out, that's true. Uh, if I had an ovarian cancer case, I wouldn't do it that way. Uh, but if it's a pelvic floor case or pelvic repair case, it's, it's a great way to do it. Vaginal surgery is a great way to go. Well, um, it's kind of a good news, bad news sort of thing. Uh, you know, with C-sections, typically, um, so, so the question was, if you had a C-section, does it help the bladder or decrease your risk of bladder problems? Okay, so remember, uh, the vaginal delivery part is bad because it tears the supporting structures. Uh, C-section is not 100% protective of bladder function and it goes back to that nerve damage issue. So some women will still have bladder issues because the nerves to the bladder have been injured during that latter part of pregnancy. So the vagina will be relatively normal in terms of its shape and size and position. The function of the bladder may be 
uh, compromised because of the nerves. So if you're gonna do any vaginal surgery, um, actually, you know, for years and years, people thought that C-sections would make it harder to do vaginal surgery. But actually, that's, that's not true because the C-section scar is above you. If you go underneath everything, you're actually going in unscarred territory. So it's much, much easier for me to go underneath the scar than to go through it. So I don't, I don't hesitate to operate on a patient with a previous C-section. I'd much rather do that vaginally than do it abdominally. Uh, now the problem is, since it may not be a structural issue, that, that nerve problem may be best treated with physical therapy or medications. I, I can't think of the last patient I referred to surgery or took to surgery that I didn't refer first for pelvic floor therapy. Uh, because a lot of women get a lot of result and a lot of success with non-surgical treatment. You know, I mean, I'm a surgeon, I make a living doing surgery, but if I can get you better without going through all that, it's a good deal for you. You, know, you win on that deal. But previous C-section is not a contraindication to any sort of bladder repair at all. Yeah, so the question is, uh, you know, hysterectomy 20 years or so ago, bladder tack or bladder support a couple of times, and it still doesn't work or it's failed. And this is a problem. I think this goes back to why women put up with leaking so much because, you know, we didn't really have a lot of great procedures. And this kind of goes back to the physics of, of the bladder. What we used to do with a bladder tack is that if you can imagine this is the bladder, this is the urethra, and the problem with leaking after childbirth or you know, uh, pelvic floor injury is that the urethra moves too much. There's no kinking to it. So when you laugh, sneeze, or cough, the urethra just flaps around. So what the bladder tech was, was we would take the, ure the bladder and smack it way up against the pubic bone. That's, that doesn't work. I mean, it'll keep you from leaking, but you have to learn how to urinate again. You have to keep a catheter in for a couple weeks, major surgery. That, that was the best we had, and it only worked half the time. So you went through all that stuff, and you're like flipping a coin saying, well, it might work, it might not. What the slings do is different. We've kind of finally realized you know, how anatomy works and how the physics of it work, the mechanics of it. We want to put the sling and the backstop underneath the middle part of the urethra. So when you laugh, sneeze, cough, the middle part gets kinked, and that's why you stay dry. So if you haven't had a sling, you probably haven't had you know, the appropriate, you know, from a mechanical standpoint, repair. Because we didn't know any better. We were just tacking things up. We didn't know. Another thing is if the bladder's out of place, we may not have identified which of those supporting structures are out of whack. Remember, if you're on your, can if you're on your uh, hammock and you're falling on the ground, well, if you think the problem is with the canvas, but really the problem is the tree fell down, you can sew that canvas together all you want. It's not going to help you. So I think that was one of the problems. We were, we were misdiagnosing what the pelvic floor defect was. So a you know, long answer to your question there is that, yeah, you can definitely repair and redo a bladder, especially if it hasn't been done the right, time, right way the first time. And that's not a bad thing about the previous doctor. It's just that we just didn't know so much about the physics of, of the complexity of the bladder and of the pelvic organs and how the muscles play a role and how the nerves are involved. We had no clue. We just figured just tack everything up and it works. But it doesn't. I mean, it really is complex. So we, we could probably fix that. Um, yeah, TBT means transvaginal tape or tension-free tape. Um, these are nice because you don't have to, it's very, the incision we use are about the size of a ballpoint pen uh, incision. They're very, very small. And then the vaginal incision is about two centimeters. So yeah, TBT or TOT. This is a good, good point. You know, question, you know, the issue is uh, new problems after prolapse surgery. Okay, so you didn't leak before your surgery and now you leak after. Okay, this is how Mother Nature kind of helps you out sometimes. So say this is your urethra again, and this is your bladder. Well, over time, the bladder falls down. Well, look what happens. You get kinked. So, you know, you're feeling pretty good. You know, you're laughing, you're sneezing, you're jumping with the kids on trampoline, you're not leaking, you feel great. But you got a lot of pressure because this vagina is out of place. Well, look what we did. We pulled the vagina all the way up, put the bladder back in normal position. Oh no, look we have now, perfectly straight urethra that leaks. So what would we do? We caused a new problem. We didn't adhere to our principles. That's why I test everyone ahead of time because um, I, can, I, I hate to be in that situation. So we do the bladder test, and if I notice that that little muscle here is real weak, I will tell you that, look, there's a good chance that if you don't do this other procedure at the same time, you're gonna leak. Now a lot of times papers, patients will say, well, if I leak, we'll deal with it then. Because I can't guarantee they're going to leak. But, but I tell them, no, 
Gagging was good for sex, but that's it. Um, well, the TVT is commonly offered, and I think that um, you know, the issue is you don't want to add it if you don't need it, because if you add it and you don't need it, you won't pee at all, and that's really annoying. So I would tell you that um, you can argue about, you know, should you do pre-op testing, and I really think you should, because then you give her... Um, you know what? Honestly, most urologists, if they wanted to work a lot with women, they would have been gynecologists. You know, they like men. You know, they're handling penises all day. They don't want to deal with the women. You know, I think that uh, you should see a gynecologist who has an interest in urogynecology. So someone like me, um, and some people downtown. You know, that do a good job. No, we can do systemetric testing in the office. It's a simple test. It takes about 20 minutes to do. Uh, you, my nurse does it while I'm in the office. You watch TV. We fill the bladder up with some fluid. We want to try to get you to laugh, sneeze, cough, kind of recreate the symptoms. It gives you a lot of information. It doesn't, re doesn't involve any radiation or anything like that. Um, but it's, it's a very useful test. And I would, I would never operate on someone without doing it. Yeah. So we do it all the time. That's the issue. I mean, we have really nice, um, you know, good procedures now because people understand, you know, what, what we're doing, how the mechanics of the pelvis work. And uh, they're respecting, you know, what, you know, nature gave us, and we just repair that anatomy, restore it, and it usually will, will behave very well. Okay. Uh, question is why people get up a lot at night. And it's a very common problem. First of all, uh, only in America do we think we should sleep eight hours uninterrupted, okay? <laughs> Um, everywhere else in the world, it's assumed that you'll be getting up at least once or twice. Okay. Okay, so you are walking around all day long. You are, you are minding your own business, having no problem. Uh, all your blood is down your legs. Your kidneys are up in your back. You're not making a whole heck of a lot of urine. You lay flat. All of a sudden, your kidneys get all the blood they want, and the kidneys are just doing their job. They're making urine. Well, you know, the bladder is only so big. You're laying there and you say, okay, you know, I'm waking up, I gotta go. It's because the kidneys are doing exactly what they're supposed to do. They're making urine because you're getting more blood to the kidneys. Now, if you're getting up six or seven times at night, that's a problem. The other issue too is I have a lot of women come in and say, oh, I get up five times at night. I go, well, are you getting up because you have to go to the bathroom? Or are you getting up because you're up? And then you say, well, since I'm up, I might as well go. There's a big difference there, <laughs> okay? so. Sometimes it's just getting the history straight, but a lot of times, you know, these patients are on blood pressure medicines, so they're taking diuretics. They're under this impression that you have to drink like five gallons of water a day. Let me tell you right now, okay, you don't, okay? If you're thirsty, your body's gonna tell you you're thirsty. There's two things you really need, air and water. You can't hold your breath more than like, you know, a minute, okay? You're gonna breathe. If you're really thirsty, if you, if you really need all that extra water, your body's gonna tell you. If you just drink a lot of water, just drink a lot of water, guess what? You're going to be going to the bathroom a lot. And, and I, I, as long as you have normal mental function, you know, as long as you're you know, not you know, demented in a nursing home or something, you're going to do fine with it. You don't, you're not going to drown. You're not going to like, dehydrate yourself. Uh, you don't need five gallons of water. Well, so the question is, what are the limitations after vaginal surgery? I would tell you, you know, for years and years and years, we told women that they couldn't lift anything more than five pounds after surgery for six weeks. And someone finally you know, did some studies and said, well, you know, let's think about all the things we do every day and see how much pressure they put on our pelvis. And they found out that standing, uh, getting up from a chair to a standing position put as much stress on your pelvis as lifting 25 pounds. So I have never, ever, ever told someone not to get up out of a chair in 20 years of doing surgery. So why would I tell them now, you know, don't lift more than five pounds? So I've really, I've liberalized my restrictions. I think 25 pounds of lifting for six to eight weeks, you should not do any more than that. Um, if we're doing a lot of repair work in the vagina, you shouldn't have anything in the vagina, no sex for about six or eight weeks. You know, anything else is fine, but no, nothing inside the vagina. Um, but exercise is fine, walking is fine, bike riding, Stairmaster, treadmill, fine, you know, Going to work is fine. Driving a car is fine. I mean, there's no reason why you can't drive a car just because you had, you know, some vaginal reconstruction done. I mean, you're not driving with your vagina. You can drive. It's not a problem. So I think we have to, we have to be realistic about what we tell patients. If we're going to do something and, and inconvenience them, you better have a reason. So the only thing would be the lifting and the sex. That's the only limitations I put on you. And that, that's, you know, most people get around that. It's more the partner issue. You know, they, they always complain about that. But that's it. So, questions, can childbirth cause us? 
Um, you know, I think as a baby's moving down the birth canal, uh, by the time that you can see the baby's head, the damage has already been, been done. We had some, we had some pretty nice MRI studies that show actually dynamic MRI of the baby moving down. When I used to do OB, you could actually hear those ligaments pop. The first time the mom had a baby, you could hear that pop. Um, so it, it happens way before the baby's ready to come out as, as the baby's moving down. And honestly, it's usually the first baby that does, you know, does the, the damage. <laughs> okay, in that situation, you would definitely need uh, urodynamic testing. Or, or the question was, she's had the MMK, which is the old, you know, flip everything back against the pubic bone, plus she's had the new sling. So now she's leaking again, what do we do? Definitely need to have the, uh, the testing done in the office to see what the capacity of the bladder is, if there's nerve supply issues, if the bladder's hyper irritable, if the muscles are suddenly weak. Definitely, that's a complex case, and it would definitely need someone who does a lot of bladder repair. So definitely something we would be capable of taking care of. So that's definitely something you'd want to do a full workup on. Um, so the question is, you had a hysterectomy, and then you had a, a sling, or you had a MMK. What did you have? You had the hysterectomy, and then what else? The balking, okay. So she had hysterectomy and balking. And if you're having symptoms, if the bladder's misbehaving, it's not working the way you want it, you come in, we, we do the physical exam, we you do the pelvic exam, we get the systemetrogram, and we see you know, what we can do to help you. I, I think that if the balking, I wouldn't repeat the balking, I don't think, because it hasn't behaved very well at this point. Yeah, but right now you probably have scarring along that urethra and it probably is not gonna work again. So I would say coming in, we, we can evaluate that. Okay, so I think that's it. Well, thank you very much for your attention.